it's still Tuesday, the twentieth and the, the the 18th of July 2023 and you might think I have nothing better to do than to read and you might very well be right I'm reading out of Carola she lived uh, in early 16th century she was born on the 4th of May 1510 and this life of Carola it's entitled life as Carola is the life or one life of John Grant she lived uh, between 1907 and 1989 and she was the illegitimate daughter, I mean Carola was, John Grant was not, Grant, uh, John Grant was the daughter of a very intelligent scientist and a society, what would you say, I wanted to say a society psychist, psychic, psychic a very psychic woman, anyway I am going to read about Carola, uh, about John Grant, um, as soon as I finish this one, which uh, is why I uh, want to continue, because we are coming to the end here, for another two chapters. Uh, so she is the daughter, illegitimate daughter of Lord Griffin. She and her mother were banished from the castle, and um, she's had quite an ordeal in her life. She is now married to Carlos, who rescued her from the, uh, I want to say nunnery, uh, from the convent of the White Sisters where she was tortured. And uh, she met Alcestis, who is Carlos's godson. And Carlos is very keen that they are good friends and they indeed are. More so, really. We are here on chapter 25 and it is the third part. In, uh, entitled Lament for a Lute. Instead of we've heard returning to my body reluctantly, I woke up to a new joy. Even Anna noticed the change in me, yet if she guessed it, it came from my love for Alcestis, she had no misgivings. For the first time since I had been a child, I was eager for life. I made myself believe that Alcestis would leave the sea and be content to stay with me. We shared the unspoken thought that Carlos was old and that it would be easy to wait until time had set me free to sail to the island where we need no longer deny our love. He might have been a knight in one of the stories I had woven from the tapestries in my father's castle, and I his princess. I lived in the sweat, sweet airs of the present, trying to hold each hour of this vivid warmth to clothe them safe in memory and keep them like the sand in an hourglass, so that through the future I could live in love. I was content that we should not be lovers, until one day I said to Alcestis, if you had not taken me into your heart, you might have found another woman, who would have given you so much more than I. What more could a man want than to love a goddess, even from afar? A goddess? No. Only a woman kept from your arms by barren vows. It was only then that Alcestis knew I was wife to Carlos only in name. I tried to make him understand that Carlos had not cheated me of my youth, but he said, One day I will make you break your marriage vows. I think I could make you break them even if your virginity was sworn to Christ. Then he released me. Is that why you seem so cold? Do you strive for the austerity of a nun? I thought with bitterness of cloistered days. I find no special virtue in virginity. All women are born with it, and they may lose it for many reasons, but I've never believed it to hold magical properties. No man should pretend to own what he cannot possess. Carlos will never know that tomorrow for the first time you will wake as a bride. It was only that when I realized the horror my faint scars held for Alcestis that I knew Carlos had never told him what my life as Carola had been. I began to tell him some of the things I had seen as a strolling player, but I saw that it offended him to know that the woman who sang to him had learned her lutany from a jester and played a harlot singing. He knew that I was a bastard of the griffin and had been in a convent, and he must have pictured me growing up in the cloistered seclusion usual to girls who belong to noble families by blood but not by name. 
Again, I tried to tell him of the women he claimed to love, but he silenced me with endearments of the woman he claimed to love, but he silenced me with endearments, using his body as a shield against my mind. I tried so hard to stay warmly in love, but as the days passed, they seemed to draw me further away from him, until even in the midst of an embrace I seemed as remote from those figures in each other's arms as had been the statue of Apollo from the Roman lovers. Yet for a time I acquiesced hoping in his ardour to forget the lover I had hoped to find. I began to despise him for his reluctance to hear my history, and one night, when he came through the darkness to my room, he found me waiting for him in the solar. He was surprised to see me wearing the dress in which I had dined with him and Carlos. He asked, am I to be your tire woman tonight? Tonight, Alcestis, I'm in a mood for conversation and there's much you must hear before we quench the candles. He protested, but I made him listen. I told him of the time when I played in, in taverns because I was hungry, of the brothel in fume, and of the torture. I remember myself saying, the scours seemed to fall so slowly I could watch each lash uncurling in the air. Even before they fell, I felt the knotted cords tear my, wide my flesh, and always that pitiful voice, recant, recant. I says this, pulled my hands down from my eyes. Have you no pity? Why must you torture me with this horror? His face was working as if he were a child about to cry. For a moment my only thought was to comfort him, to let him find peace in my arms. Then I grew cold with the knowledge that he was not distraught for my sake, but because I had brought torture to, so close to him that it seemed part of its own experience. I knew then why sometimes when we lay together I was more lonely than I had ever been since I was Carola. Suddenly I wanted to hurt him, hurt him until he had to recognize that the tears he thought to be flowing from compassion were only a sign of weakness. I said, I have known only one other captain and his following of the sea left him less squeamish. I have seen him save a man's life by pouring hot pitch over the stump of a severed hand. Your crew must know how to attend their own wounds, for it seems their captain is too delicate to stomach even the hearing of pain. I saw the vein in his temple swell with his mounting anger, but I went on mercilessly. May the crimson rose encounter only smooth waters for a storm brings everyone close to reality, when the most sensitive must suffer with his companions. I think that if his nature had been a little more violent, Alcestis would have killed me. His hands were at my throat. Perhaps he saw himself in my eyes, for he stumbled out of the room. I heard his footstep echo down the passage. I blew out, blew out the candles and drew the curtains close. The bed was cold. I was alone in the dark. The Crippled Sailor At dawn I heard a horseman ride out of the courtyard. Though I was too proud to run to the window, I knew it was Alcestis. As I lay listening to the fading hoofbeats, I knew I had demanded from him too great an understanding. It was my own fault that the memory I had hoped to keep as talisman against the future was flawed by this bitter quarrel. I thought I might never see him again, and when Carlos told me that he had only gone to watch the refit of the Crimson Rose, it was as though I were a prisoner who received a stay of execution. Alcestis was away twenty-seven days. I dreamt of him once, but the memory I brought back was so fleeting that I was not sure whether he loved or hated me on earth. When he returned, I re recognized that there was to be an unspoken agreement between us to ignore the quarrel. Yet, though he behaved as though his love had suffered no change, I knew he was afraid of me. So I pretended to be remorseful that I had broken my marriage vows, saying that never again must we betray Carlos by being lovers. At last Alcestis agreed to an austere relationship, but in our hearts we both knew that the very unity of our bodies would have shown our secret thoughts cold as a blade of steel between us. Alcestis now spent much of his time with Pietro, a sailor he had brought back with him from the port. This man had lost his right leg below the knee, 
and the half-healed stump was only partly concealed by his tattered breeches. He swung along on his crutches faster than an ordinary man could walk, thrusting himself forward by the power of his huge shoulders. They had met in a tavern, and as they exchanged stories of their voyages, Pietro said he had newly come from Spain, where a rumour was taking hold that the earth was round. At first Alcestis had laughed at what he thought was proof of the gullibility of Spaniards, but Pietro said much that gave the story credence. Pietro's brother had been one of the crew of an ill-fated expedition whose ships had sailed from Spain in an attempt to prove this belief. It was difficult to piece the story together from the fragments that Pietro remembered. It seemed the crew had wintered on ice-bound shore, short of provisions, mutiny threatening to divide the weary men. Time after time they thought they had found the channel that would lead beyond the barrier of the new land into a new further ocean, but always it proved to be only the wide mouth of another river. They demanded to turn back, but their leader heartened them with his courage, drove them with his scorn. Still farther south, another channel. Surely this is only another river? Two ships deserted and drove before the relentless western wind on a homeward course. Between the dark shores of a desolate coast, three ships battled on, repulsed again and again by screaming winds. At last, even the winds grew weary. The ships crept forward, their crews listening in apprehension for the leadman call, leadman's call. The shores fell back only to narrow again those desolate demon-haunted stories. Then they came to another ocean and new victory. They thought that a few days' voyage would bring them to the Indies, but farther and farther the horizon beckoned. One ship was lost in a storm. They came to islands. Here their leader was killed by savages. They dared not return on their outward course. Even the fear of reaching the edge of the world was less than the terrors of the haunted channel. So in the face of a dead man's vision, a solitary ship still sailed on into the west, crippled her timber strained, weighed down by the water gaining in her hold. She brought her crew back to the Spanish coast, only to founder at her anchorage. If their leader had lived to return in triumph from the east, his world word would have been unchallenged. But the witness of illiterate sailors is not readily accepted by authority. Even the scholar who had made the voyage found mockers, for he seemed so much excited at the failure of the logbook to tally with the calendar. His hearers laughed and said that any prisoner would tell him it was impossible to keep a faithful tally of days. The scra they scratched the first month on the wall beside them, then they forget a day, they score it or score it twice, some are even released thinking it must be spring to find the autumn of the previous year. Why should this man, shut in his little ship, a landsman too, think it's important his tally shows a different date to ours? Why is he so insistent? His man mind must be turned by his privations. Why should we believe him? But is he right? Is the world round or flat? These questions fired Alcestis, as even his vision of the island had not done. When he was with Pietro, I knew he had forgotten me. I was only a woman who could play no part in the plans of sea adventures. I never told him that why I thought the world was round was because of a vision seen after a fresco had frightened me when a child. There is a sky on the other side of the earth as well as on this side. I tried by every means in my power to bring Alcestis back to the ambitions he had held before Pietro came, but I failed. No longer would the Crimson Rose sail on a quest for freedom. Her course would be set on the words of a crippled sailor. Pietro lodged a wine shop near the house. Almost every day I would hear him come slowly up the steep street, a dragon footstep, then the chink of iron against the cobblestone. For now that the stump was hard enough to bear his weight, he had a wooden leg. I tried to argue that my distrust of him was caused by jealousy, but at last I was sure he was evil. In spite of his protestations to Altacestis, I knew he did not want to sail in search of honour 
or to chart new seas. He was driven only by his greed for wealth. He would have liked to show his hostility towards me, but fear of Alcestis kept his enmity concealed. Sometimes I would be in the room when they discussed preparations for the journey. Everything must be sacrificed to increase the distance we can sail without a landing. If we are long become, what do you think is the lowest ration on which the crew can work? We might take wine for the crew to use when the water has gone foul. Alcestis entrusted Pietro with money for the victualling. He ordered that only meat of good quality should go into the brine tubs. I have warned him of the filth I had seen put into them in fume. He would not believe me when I told him that his crook would suffer because Pietro cheated him. I said, you seem to think only of the voyage, Alcestis. Have you forgotten what you mean to do when it is over? It is not enough that I shall have made history for Italy. History belongs to the men of the future, and will they value it? You may help to prove the world is round, but will that make the people who dwell on it any happier? A shorter road to the Indies will make the merchants richer. They will have more of the precious seeds of the pepper tree to weigh against their gold. Spices will not stave off hunger from the poor, but perhaps you have forgotten them? Of course I have not forgotten, but a man cannot live on dreams. It is easy to talk of an island where the people are ruled to their contentment. It is easy to talk of paradise, but one still has to wake to commonplace reality. When we talked of that island together, it seemed more than a dream. Once I thought you more than mortal, but you are only a woman. Though gracious and of brilliant wit, you told me we shared those dreams and I began to believe you. I thought it was I who had faith in priests that ruled with visionary power, for it seemed you told me of things I had once known, and that love could turn a seaman into a poet who was content to dream. So you have awakened, Alice Alcestis. Do you find your world grey or splendid? I find it a man's world, a world where men rule, seek for new lands, new thoughts, a world in which women should be content to play their part, to be loved, to be ready, to welcome their heroes home, to bear sons and daughters, to please the sons of other women. Why will you not be content to be a woman, Kaola? Was I such a very disappointing mistress? I think that you have been too much and too little. You never let me think that I was the sun in your universe, though that is a compliment which all women should pay to the men they love, in that you were too little. In your eyes I did not see myself as a hero, as a man has a right to see himself in a woman's eyes. My love for you showed me my weakness instead of my power. Then why do you say I gave you so much? Too much. Suddenly I saw a flash of that which shone behind the dreamer, the lover, the sea captain. He said, you asked me what was too much, only that you have shown me something in yourself which will make all other women, however virtuous, however beautiful, seem tavern drab beside the thought of you. We kissed each other as we had used to do, and there was no longer a barrier between us. This is the end of chapter 25.